thank you so much for being here. If you haven't already, we really would love to know where you're joining us from. We have some people already from across our state of North Dakota, Montana, and Virginia, and it just is really excited to have you guys here, and we really appreciate that you guys are spending the afternoon with us. So let us know where you're joining us from, or joining, yeah, from, and uh, what you currently coach. Um, kind of joked, but if you coach a wool judging team, that's okay. And you're on here to learn about horse stuff. We are so excited that you're here tonight. We have a really brilliant team of members here in the state of North Dakota that serve our animal science um, programs across the state for 4-H. And so uh, just commend these individuals on championing and charging forward a lot of animal science things in our state. Uh, currently, Today, uh, helping me co-host tonight is Brianna Kaiser and um, Emily Burkett. And so we're really excited that uh, I have such amazing individuals and they have such expertise to help um, do things like this for you guys. And that sounds like uh, we've got some really great people from across our state too that are jumping on this call. So just talk to Julie this morning. Hi, Julie. <laughs> All right. Uh, so today, as we kind of jump in, um, we've got a little bit of an outline for you. We're going to first cover Quiz Bowl, go over contest rules and activities. Then we're going to go through demonstrations and illustrated talk for horses, a little bit about format, some expectations, and then jump through public speaking. And then after Quiz Bowl, we'll talk about resources as well. But on the final couple of slides, we'll go through some resources for public speaking and demonstrations how you coaches maybe can help get some of those kids started or some other fun things and strategies to think about as coaches and um, working with your kids because we all know getting up in front of somebody is pretty intimidating. And then as far as quiz bowl goes, there's such a breadth of information. It's just sometimes hard to know where to get started. And then in recruitment strategies and questions and answers. So um, some of the objectives for our horse contest, and that means all things horse, um, is we really want to encourage our youth and stimulate that animal science or ag industry perspective. Um, this is where we get to build those skills and abilities uh, in our youth. I'm not going to read all of this to you guys, but it's a fantastic opportunity. Most of you coaches already know on here um, that we get to pour into them. We get to be the ones that help to build our future leaders and give them those incredible skills to thrive, especially in an ever-changing workforce today. And so what they do here and what you pour into them now is going to no doubt help them be successful in the future. They may not know it now, but they will look back on it and they will certainly remember. Um, and I'm actually going to share a poll here really quick, just because I am curious um, on who's joining us. So I'm going to launch a poll. And it's got two questions on it. The first one um, is just your background. So you might also be a coach and an extension agent, or you might be a teacher and a coach. So please check as many as you want. And the second question on there is, how long have you been coaching? Just a get a, a variation or a breadth of uh, who's on the call um, tonight. And while you guys are doing that, um, it's a small group. And so just know that if you want to have a question and you feel like you want to unmute and ask that question, super informal tonight. We're all here to learn from each other. So please, we welcome all of that and encourage questions and even suggestions. If you as a coach have found something that really has worked for you, we want to hear it. We want to share that with all the other coaches on the, tonight's call. Um, so please be, uh, be brave and share those things with us. All right, excellent. Thank you all for answering that poll for me. All right, so we're gonna kick off with Quiz Bowl first. Uh, here in North Dakota, um, we have everything on one day. So on Saturday, we do all of our horse judging and hippology. And then on Sunday, we do our Quiz Bowl, public speaking demonstrations and illustrated talks. Um, so your state might be a little bit different. And as we're going through our rules tonight, just definitely make sure that um, you are pertaining to whatever rules are uh, hold it holding to your local state or regional contest because it sometimes varies 
I know here in the state of North Dakota, we really strive to have our state contest to parallel the national contest rules. So we try to set our seniors up for success when they go on to national contests. And our national contest that we attend here on the Western side um, is the Western National Roundup in Denver. Those of you on the Eastern side go to Louisville. Um, I've officiated out there. It's also a great contest. They have a nice big arena um, and is, is very well ran. Um, and so um, if you have any questions about those, definitely let us know. A little bit of bragging moment. Um, our demonstration team this year got reserve champion at the national contest. And uh, we had a public speaking individual get fourth overall at the national contest. So um, really proud of our, our kids that represent our states. And just, I know you guys feel the same way. You're just so excited when our youth go on um, to do big things. All right, so going back to our quiz bowl part of things, uh, I'm sure across the country for your states, you might have a dress code, you might not. Um, we certainly do here in the state of North Dakota. In our quiz bowl, we definitely can't have any sort of electronics allowed in the holding rooms or in the contest. And basically that's just to make sure that coaches aren't um, texting kids potential answers or questions in the holding room and or um, we also don't allow any sort of things in the, uh, the actual match room or the contest room. That way our coaches aren't writing down different answers or writing down questions. Um, and just to make sure that we have a fair playing field. Um, so no notes or resources allowed in the contest room or on the competition table. Just the wisdom in the young adults brains is allowed. Uh, contests uh, will utilize notes and other resources in the Holy Room. They can certainly do that, but no electronic devices. Um, only participants in the holding room, so no coaches or parents in the holding room. And again, as mentioned, no note taking or recording of cell phones or anything else um, in the, the actual contest room. So um, that is an actual cause for disqualification. And if somebody does see you, you will be asked to leave um, the actual match room too as well. So just be careful. We have two divisions, junior and senior. Um, ages are of December 31st of the previous year. Um, so, and that again parallels with the national contest. So those 14 to eight year old seniors, um, that's what they require at the national level. So we can ensure that they are of age to head on and represent North Dakota at the national contest. For most quiz bowl teams, um, they're always gonna be a team of four, but you can certainly have that fifth member. And Emily, if I talk too fast, please jump in and, and say anything that I forget. Same with you, Brianna. Um, if you have that fifth member team as an alternate, they have to be named prior to the match starting. Um, so that's certainly something that needs to be addressed. And that fifth member team also gets individual points. So that's important that they get named. The alternate must attend all matches that the team is involved in. So they can't sit outside the room. They have to be right there up front, ready to switch out when the next phase enters. An alternate can be substituted at the completion of a phase. It can't be entered at the middle or um, of a phase. You have to wait until each phase is over. No substitutes are allowed during a phase, unless for some reason, let's say a contestant got super sick and had to leave, then I'm sure we can make sure we can make adjustments and be flexible in that capacity. If an alternate enters, they must remain in the contest for the rest of the phase. Only the coach is the one that gets to do um, any sort of ask for substitution. And they're the only ones that gets to challenge a question. That's why when we have a quiz bowl, and I'm gonna show a picture here in a little bit, that kind of shows the people that manage the contest as it plays. And so we have a judge that is gonna be the official person that says yes or no. And we try to make sure that that judge is a veterinarian. So they are certainly of caliber to know the answers um, to all questions asked. If a four person team enters the contest and a member, as we mentioned, is unable to continue, um, then we can certainly 
have them to continue with the three member team, but they won't get some of the bonus points. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later in the contest and what those bonus points even mean and when they're accumulated. So here's the picture um, that I was kind of telling you guys about. Um, so over here on the right side is all of the contestants. If you haven't ever seen a quiz bowl match before, um, this is how every quiz bowl match is usually lined up. So in the center, you're gonna have all of your, two, your, your ones sit down right here on the number one spot. And those are your um, chairs. So that um, person there is the captain of the team. And in some of your phases, they're the only ones that get to talk. So whoever sits down in that chair um, has to be the spokesman in a couple of the phases. So make sure that you discuss with your teams which uh, individuals want to be the spokesman and is confident in that aspect uh, because whoever sits in those chairs, uh, that's who they will become. And then following to the next um, shoulder of the one person is going to be your number two chair. So you can see that on both sides of the table. And then it's going to follow with the number three chair on both sides of the table. And then your very last person on both sides of the chair or both sides of the table is your chair four individual. And so um, whichever team sits down on the left and right, they usually get to choose as they come in. Um, and once they sit down, they must remain in those seats until the completion of the game. So we usually have two scorekeepers and timers in our, our particular classrooms. If we have enough people, we have one, um, two scorekeepers, usually one's doing silent scorekeeping on the table and one scorekeeper is doing one up on the board for all the coaches and parents to see in the audience to keep track. And then we usually actually have an, another additional person for timer, um, just so they're not doing multiple things at once. The moderator is the person that's going to be reading the questions. And so we try to get somebody that's familiar with the equine species so they can pronounce some of the things that uh, need to be pronounced. And then we have the judge, which again, as mentioned, we try to get a veterinarian to make sure that if a challenge, a question were to be challenged, we would make sure that we have somebody that's qualified to answer that correctly. And I, like I said, if you have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to put it in the chat on mic. Maybe if you aren't super comfortable and you want to secretly message um, Brianna or Emily um, on here, or I see Brian Zimbrick, he's uh, one of our um, individuals that I've been hosting these um, definitely pages on here, you know, feel free to to message one of those individuals if you would like, like there's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, most likely if you're thinking it, somebody else is too. So we definitely want to hear it. One more thing, um, when you're having your match, it might be good to consider having your, um, your books or anything in, um, writing that you got your questions from that way, if there is a challenge, someone can just pull it up and be like, Oh, it's on page four. It's actually this, not that, or th that kind of thing. It's nice to have your materials in the room with you as well. So if you're considering hosting your own contest, um, there's some ways to help make the flow go smoothly. So you see how the buzzers are in front of the kids here. I like to tape them down just so that, you know, when we get really excited in there and we're, we're ready to press that button, some kids get really into it and like, right. So I like to tape them just for a little bit more security on those buzzers. Um, and so that we're not tripping over wires when we're moving in and out and, um, also having a whiteboard, but we'll talk more about that later. Yes. Such good things, Emily. Um, thank you for mentioning that. And we'll talk about equipment later too, because um, there's lots of different types of buzzard systems. And we'll even talk more about these little cards that are sitting in front of each kiddo um, here in a minute and why those are also important when you're preparing for your contest. 
Um, I always do kind of like what Emily said when she mentioned to have those standard references in front of you or in the room somewhere. When I write my questions, I make sure that I put the book and the page number where I got that question from, just in case we need to reference it. Um, I know it takes a lot of time. I've written thousands of questions. And so um, I bow down to those of you that have had to do it. Um, and it just makes it a lot easier to, if you um, have to look those questions up, make sure they're referenced somewhere. And two, it just gives credibility to the contest that you're hosting as well. Good. And then just something to add, as a coach, if you are challenging, you only get a few minutes to find the correct answer within the materials. If you are challenging, you can't just say, I know it's the wrong answer. You have to be able to prove it. So that's why having the materials in the rooms also um, for those judge, for any of those coaches that might be challenging a question. This is correct. Thank you, Brianna. All right, so we're going to jump into our phases. And so again, if you have any questions as we're going through each different phase, because they are different and they can get confusing. And so um, please jump in and ask us if you have any questions. So phase one on one, I'm going to jump back to the um, picture here for two seconds. So one on one means chair one and chair one go up against each other. Chair two and chair two go up against each other. Chair three, chair three, chair four, chair four. So they do that a couple times. Um, so only those people from chair one chair and the respective other chair get to answer. And your moderator, what I like to do um, if you're hosting a contest is have a moderation sheet to help that moderator kind of know the flow of the contest. So for example, or when you first start out the contest, you'll make sure that, I'm gonna jump back to that picture, you identify each chair and each kid gets to test their buzzer. And Emily had a great point, tape those babies down because the kids love to jump on top of those and slide them around sometimes. Um, so just a fun thing to make sure the contest runs really smooth with a, a holding or like a script of some sort. Um, so they get 12 questions throughout the entire set. Um, so kind of just said that second star team one against team one. Again, only those individuals get to answer. There's no collaboration between team members at all. It's just that one individual against the respective chair and they can't receive help from anybody. They get five seconds to answer that question after being recognized by the moderator. So we try to be pretty strict on our seniors because at the national level, if they answer without the moderator um, actually saying, you know, identifying them by their name, uh, then they actually get some point deductions. And so we have to make sure that we try to follow those rules here. We're probably a little bit more flexible on the juniors unless they just like blurt out the answer and it's not even the kid that pushed the button. Um, so uh, sometimes we just wanna make sure we're encouraging participation in our juniors and that they have fun. So correct answers are worth two points and correct answers are worth minus one. However, and we decided um, as a state and uh, as, as the state specialists for you coaches or any other specialists on the call, really make sure that you're getting the voice of your 4-H leaders and coaches in these instances uh, so you get their perspective on things. So my coaches decided that we really wanted to not have incorrect answer deductions for the junior division because we wanted to encourage participation. So we took it away. Um, so they don't get any point deductions if they miss the answer. So if each team member answers a question correctly, so that's those little cards. I'm going to flip back one more time. These little cards in front, they have a plus sign and a minus sign on each on one side is the plus one side is the minus. And if they get the question correctly, they flip it around to the plus side. And if all four of these members get pluses that first round, then they get to those, that actual bonus point for team participation. And that's that two points. And then once they all get them all four, then they get to flip them back around and they can earn another two plus points. 
there's no actual bonus questions asked in this phase. Um, there's just bonus team points earned, if that makes sense. One thing I want to add about one on one is if you show that picture, Leanne, of mm -hmm. the group. Um, so say you have a kid on your team who's always got the right answer when you practice. It's their time to have some patience and wait their turn. But also if you have a kiddo who's a little shy, but doesn't get the chance to speak because everybody else speaks for them. I've seen kids take advantage of that situation. Like I get to talk now, right now is my turn. And sometimes they do melt and like get really nervous when it's their turn. But when they get that question, right, they light up, it builds their self-confidence. And it's this, the one-on-one -on -one round is where you really see it, I think. And so that's, I, I'm a fan of the one-on-one -on -one first round, so. I love it. Good addition. Thank you so much, Emily. Yeah, this, this quiz bowl is pretty scary. I'm sure um, you've seen some of your own youth be intimidated by it, but what, a, what great skills come from participating in this. It's some pretty awesome stuff. All right, moving into the second phase. So once we finish the 12 questions from the one-on-one -on -one phase, then the moderator will identify, all right, again, this is from a script that we create um, to help that moderator flow from one phase to the next. Identify to all of your team members that, okay, we're done with the one-on-one -on -one phase, we're moving into the toss-up phase and bonus phase. And then we have our moderator actually explain just a quick tidbit, basically what's on this slide. Um, just as a good reference point in remembering, telling them, okay, we've got 12 toss-up points with five seconds to answer after being recognized by the moderator. Any team member from any team can buzz in. So basically get your hand on the buzzer and whoever answers the fastest gets to play. Um, again, no help from any team members to answer the toss-up question. And so that toss up question is plus one point if they get it wrong, minus one point if they get it, um, sorry, plus one point if they get it right, minus one if they get it wrong. And again, we took it away from the juniors. They don't have any point deductions, again, trying to encourage participation. And then every fourth toss up question has a bonus question attached to it. So if they answer, if one of the team members answer that toss-up question with that fourth, that fourth toss-up question with the bonus attached to it, then um, they get that correct. They get to go ahead and um, walk through that with the team. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, uh, just a little bit more in detail and how that works. Um, if the question, because I know you guys have probably done this, like the kids, they know the questions, like kind of like the back of their hand and the, the moderator will start reading it and doesn't even get to finish the question. And the youth might already know what it is. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they are super whiz kids and they know the exact answer after three words have been said out of a paragraph sentence. Um, and uh, that moderator has to stop as soon as that buzzer is pushed. They cannot complete that sentence and that participant can't ask for the moderator to finish reading. Once that buzzer gets hit, they just have to answer. And so um, really making sure when you're teaching your youth, um, if they feel confident, go for it because other team members are gonna do it. Um, but just know that, that that question is not gonna get read to completion um, if they get buzzed in before it's finished. Um, the, if the bonus question isn't, uh, if they didn't get that question right, the fourth question with the bonus attached to it, that bonus will continue to move to the next question. Um, and so uh, that's kind of a neat opportunity. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. If the answer to any toss up question um, is is not answered uh, correctly, we don't automatically just give them the answer because that question can be turned over to the next team. Um, so if the question was read to completion, it will not be read again um, for them. If it was read to completion, the moderator will reread the question for the other team um, 
And then if it's answered correctly, the appropriate points will certainly be awarded to the team that um, got it. If it's an correct, answered correctly by the other team that didn't initially buzz in, no penalty points will be imposed and the answer will be read. Any questions on the toss up? I know that can kind of get confusing. So that bonus question that's attached to that fourth question of the toss up phase, um, if answered correctly, the team will have a chance to, to get at it as a team. And so um, if that toss up question with the bonus attached is not answered correctly, again, it will carry forward to the next question. So it doesn't just disappear, which is nice. Um, those of you that do other contests in our state, like our livestock quiz bowl, it's different. So it's nice to know that both of our quiz bowl contests have different rules. So it's really important to read rules. And just as a like little commercial, um, make sure your youth read the rules. Uh, I know a lot of our youth tend to be like, well, you didn't tell me that. Okay, well, it's not necessarily all on the coach to always be the dictator of the rules. It's really valuable to get, um, to a point where you teach your youth to, to know the rules themselves as the participant and that that blame doesn't always go on the coach to be the one to um, teach those rules. So uh, just as a little uh, reminder that um, it's good responsibility to teach to our kiddos. Um, if each team member answers the question correctly, uh, team will get two bonus points, which is awesome. And the team will be able to talk about, uh, again, the bonus point question before answering. They get 10 seconds as a team to collaborate and come up with an answer. But again, only the team captain in that first chair gets to actually answer. So basically, if, if chair four has the answer, chair four has to tell chair one, the team captain, what the answer is so that they can actually answer. If anyone other than the team captain answers the question, they don't get the point. So make sure that when you're practicing at home or whatnot that uh, we, we practice those. The bonus question is um, pretty awesome. Uh, so they get three points. I'm, I'm not sure why that has the other two points on here. So I apologize for that. Bonus questions are worth three points. Incorrect bonus answer, they don't get any deduction. They're not going to lose points from the bonus question. It's just a good way to get more points. They don't lose any points. Um, and there's no partial points. This is where that judge is really critical um, to make sure that that judge has the final say if they answer. Because usually the bonus question is going to be a harder question where they actually have to give multiple components. Um, so like, um, you know, name three different structures of the reproductive tract. Uh, you know, they're going to have multiple answers that are going to need to be given. And so that's kind of critical when we're thinking about those. All right, so bonus points, which we were just talking about is in the toss up phase, which is very different than team participation bonus points. Um, the team participation bonus points are only awarded in the one-on-one -on -one phase, again, with those cards that I talked about. And you can kind of see them in the picture down on the bottom right again. Um, we had just started this contest uh, up in Minot, and so nobody had flipped their cards quite yet. So you can see a minus sign on the back of those cards. Um, don't have to be fancy. It's seriously just a note card folded over with marker written on it. So um, super cheap and easy to um, implement. All team members, again, must answer that question correctly. And so four to a team, once all four of those cards get turned over with a plus sign, they get that two point bonus. Um, again, they're not awarded in the toss up phase or the sudden death rounds. That is something that um, is in the national contest rules. Just look those up. So I, I know they're underway to get changed. So maybe that'll get changed in the future. I don't know. All right, Emily, is this portion where you kind of wanted to summarize things? Um, yeah, I can. So at Quiz Bowl Contest, not only are you receiving 
points as a team, but you're also receiving points individually. And so maybe your team doesn't win the whole contest, but you can walk away a winner individually, but because you answered questions consistently and correctly throughout the contest. And so when we have our, you know, our moderator, our timekeeper, we have another person who's keeping track of the score of the whole team team versus team, but they are also tracking individual points. And so here on this picture, a correct points, a correct answer during phase one, which is the one-on-one. So one versus one, two versus two, they're going to receive two points for getting a point correct during that phase. If they're a senior and they answer incorrectly, they lose one point. Um, Let's see. And contestant other than designated contestant response. That's where we really want to encourage, especially our juniors to wait their turn when people are, are talking. And sometimes when you just know the answer, you just want to blurt it out. So it's, it's fun to watch them mature through it. Um, and by the time they're seniors, they, they've, they've learned to wait their turn. Um, if there's team participation bonuses, Let's see, Uh, three member teams must designate a fourth chair in order to receive the bonus point as a team. Um, No teams of three. I apologize if you hear the train in the background, sorry. Um, Let's see, toss up, so correct is one point. Seniors, it's also one point if they get it incorrect, they lose that. Um, Team bonus is three. And no points are lost if they answer bonus points incorrectly. And so, This will help you with the team portion. This will help you with the the individual as well. So it's nice to have this sheet there because it's very quick and easy to look at. Um, Let's see. Oh, so under miscellaneous here, there's failing to answer after signaling intent to answer. And this is seniors only. So I saw this for the first time at a different contest in a different state. And we had never talked about this before. So if a senior buzzes in and they're like, oh shoot, I don't know the answer. They lose a point. You have to at least guess, right? Um, No matter what happens. Um, Answering a question before being acknowledged by the moderator. Again, um, if you're ever hosting your own contest, another Um, housekeeping thing is to get either name tags that are really nice and visible that you can wear on the kid's shirt. Or um, I've seen other contests where they have little name plates. That way, when you have teams with Sadie, Bailey, and Haley, and they all sound the same, Mm -hmm. uh, you can see them right away and and look at the name and then look at the kid. Um, That happens on our team, I guess. Let's see, protesting, you will lose a point if you can't prove that your answer that you think is correct. Um, Let's see, if it's upheld, obviously there's no deduction because it's a correct answer. Um, And we don't see C very often where you abuse your power. Um, You'll be asked to leave if you're rude or inconsiderate. And we we don't have those kinds of people, right? (laughs) Participating in quiz bowl, so. Perfect. Good sportsmanship are all around. Yes. Um, and that goes for coaches, leaders, and everybody. Thank you so much, Emily. And um, the three-member team is very specific to North Dakota, and your state might have it as well. Um, we brought that in for the juniors because sometimes we have a hard time getting uh, a full team together, even if we're combining counties to form a team. So just because we want to encourage participation, we allow that three member team. Um, So again, it's just for the juniors because a three member team would never be allowed to go to nationals. So, all right. So as I stated previously throughout the day, both team and individual scores will be tracked. So obviously the team scores will help you move on if it's a bracket type contest. Occasionally there's round robin type contests where everybody plays against each other, points are tallied, and whoever has the most successful day or incurred the most points wins overall. That's a fun way to get more rounds in, especially if you have a younger team 
that you want to build some self-confidence and they're like, we don't, we're not very good because we lost in the first round. Well, here's your chance. We can play all day. You'll get it figured out. And so just another tidbit, if you're going to host your own, um, so individual scores, as I said, you must, um, answer correctly to gain your individual score. And it's based on consistency, especially at the senior level. You might be the first one to buzz and the first one to answer, but make sure that's a correct answer so that you get a positive score at the end of the day. All right. So during the match, this is what the crowd is seeing and what better way to make sure you're staying on task than having a bunch of people watch you keep score, right? And so, um, Using a plain old whiteboard, I like to draw a line right down the middle and like this team, say Ward County's over here, Montreal County's on this side, and you just track it that way. Super simple, cross out the, the point that was there before, add the one or the two or the three, if it's a bonus question, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then you have the whole crowd watching. They can also have um, the moderator or the other person tracking the individual score as well as the team score track you. So there's lots of ways to make sure that this is accurate. <laughs> if you don't want to use a plain old whiteboard, um, you can use something like this. And so I believe this was created with an Excel spreadsheet and then blown up really big and laminated and it was awesome. So we were at the Quarter Horse Congress this fall and they had this on one of their boards and I took a picture. So, and I asked them if I could. So here it is, please multiply this and use this all over. Um, this is a great way to track your scores. So notice at the top where it says one-on-one, -on -one, those open white boxes are the plus two, you know, if say chair one on the team on the right gets it correct, you put a two there. So as you go, it'll follow the chair. So chair one, and then chair twos, chair threes, chair fours, et cetera. So just like how we have it in North Dakota, there are three rounds of one-on-one -on -one questions. At the end, you'll subtotal in the yellow area so that you know which team is ahead, which one is not um that kind of thing and then usually most substitutions if you have a fifth person occur in the next round and so that's where if your chair four moves out and chair your alternate comes in you can write down that they scored those points but that's a way for you to be like oh chair one buzzed in on the left side plus one um those let's see and i think yep it shows the bonus along the right column. So if a team gets the team bonus, so in, in horse quiz bowl, and, and I think this is na nationwide, but maybe just North Dakota, if you don't answer the, the, the toss up question and there's a bonus attached to it, the bonus slides down to the next question. So it's really convenient that the bonus column is all open so that we can just slide that bonus up or down the whole time. And then you subtotal the whole open questions or the toss up questions. And then you add your two yellow. So one on one plus the open questions or toss up and that's your totals. Super slick way. This is also a great way if you're going to um, use something like this for the individual scoring. But yeah, anyone else countywide? I know some of you have, I know we have some seasoned people on here and some new people. Have you used something like this in the past? I'm seeing a few heck shake no. Okay, this might be something to, to bring up. Pretty sure it was just a big sheet that they laminated. So something simple. I already have Paige on it. She's gonna get us a copy, so. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, so back to the individual scoring. So just like I said, you don't have to win the whole contest to do well in the individual. It does help if you make it through more rounds, that way you have more opportunity to get more questions correct, especially those seniors. 
um, when they could actually lose points for being incorrect. And so on this sheet here, um, we have Sally as chair four, Jeff chair three, Mala chair two and Beth chair one. So during that one-on-one -on -one phase, we can mark how many points they got correct. Of course, there's more pressure during that, um, during the one-on-one -on -one phase. So they're, I believe they're worth more in that round. Is that correct, Leanne? On the one-on-one -on -one phase. So you can actually see on the one that we designed there, I'll, I actually put the point value up here on the top right hand corner. So I don't even have to think about it. So Perfect. the one-on-ones are plus two, yeah. Excellent. So they and are then, um, And I believe because chair one will always be the team captain, they wouldn't incur the bonus question or would they? Because they are the one buzzing in. Since everybody um, else isn't able to buzz in, it's only chair one. For for first phase, the team bonus or the just the the team overall? bonus. Um, team bonus is just when everybody gets a plus point. Oh, um, that's right. Yep. yep. So so chair one has to get one right. Chair two, chair three, chair four has to all get one right before any team can get that bonus point. And just in the phase one. Correct. And you'll notice on the right-hand side that I intentionally put a mark in chair one and another mark in chair four. So for those of you that are gonna host a contest, really encourage your person that's um, tabulating to make sure they put like mark C, like that little bit of the last name, because just as Emily is stressed, these individuals get points. So if mark C and mark T, um, are up against each other uh, for points on their own team, we want to know which mark is getting the correct points. Yes, and it might be good to add one more person if you're going to um, use a similar sheet for the alternate that might be subbed in. Yeah, that's actually really good. In fact, I noticed that if we go back to the one, it actually has that full column that's specifically for the alternate. So yeah, that's a really good question. All right. All right. And in North Dakota, we recognize the top five individuals. So you can do whatever you would like at your county. Yes. All right. So some resources and Brianna can certainly talk about the resource that she offers through her county. Um, and then of course the study materials. So Brianna, if you want to talk about what you have created. Yeah, sure. So I have, it's a combination of both kind of. So I have a set of flashcards. Um, we are broken down into three age categories for horse topology. So I have a set for juniors, intermediates, and seniors. And within those sets are two um, examples of quiz bowl questions for the kids to be able to study and kind of get used to kind of how those questions are going to be asked because some of them are very technical and some of them are a lot more um, in depth than what they're used to on a typical just written test. Um, so they do have examples for those ones. And then of course, as the age goes up, it gets a little bit harder for the questions, um, but within those resources, uh, they do have example of quiz bowl questions. Perfect, thank you, Brianna. And you can kind of see in this picture a little bit better of um, a different perspective. You can see how Emily, Emily actually taped these down for us when we were in uh, Watford. So we were just taping down the cord part um, on each side, just to kind of give you a perspective when we say we tape it down, um, that way it stays in place. And then here we actually have um, the farthest individual on the left towards us is being the, um, the silent scorekeeper. She, the one next to her, to her right, has the, um, the timer, so she's timing. Um, Dr. Hoffman is the moderator, and we have our vet. And then Brian's over here on the scoreboard, keeping the live score for the audience, just to kind of give you a little bit of how that might look and how big the room has to be, how many tables you might need. So as a manager, um, definitely thinking about all of these kinds of things as you're putting a contest together and practicing with your youth. 
And just again, that standard reference material for us, um, again, make sure you're always checking with your state and your rules. We pull that specifically out of the national contest rules. And so we want to parallel that national contest as close as possible. I guess one more thing I was going to add to uh, my resources. The reason I created the flashcards is because in the holding area, the kids are allowed to study. But again, they can't have any electronics. So the flashcards, so here's an example of a really big set I made first time ever. Um, it's a really great way for them to keep on studying and then not looking for electronics. And when she says flashcards, um, she's got a ton of different things, whether it's breeds. Um, I mean, Brianna, what else do you have? You have tons of different things. So for the junior ones, there's a lot more pictures that go with it. So there's uh, breeds, colors, horse parts, I just put a whole bunch together so I should know them all. Um, markings, so those are the juniors. And then for intermediates, it's the colors and the breeds again, but it's the descriptions of them. So they get used to the terminology to describe those. Um, and then the juniors and seniors do have a set of stations that they might come across at contests. So again, they get used to seeing that visual and putting them together. But the intermediates and the seniors have a lot more um, descriptions of what they're supposed to be learning. Yes, and I am, if you want, I can just send you, you can message me and I will send you a list of what each age category is. Yeah, uh, I love that. I am putting in the chat box right now. I, I hate doing this because currently this is out of order, um, out of stock, but even said the Ohio Extension Lab, if you coach something else, um, they have a multiple types of those learning lab kits. And so beef, swine, sheep, um, rabbit, you name it. Um, definitely a tool that a lot of our, our clubs use. Here in North Dakota, we have a couple sets across the state and some clubs have um, bought it themselves. The horse one is around $1,000. So it is definitely something you want to raise funds for. But um, the Ohio, or they, they have quite a bit of other resources and learning lab kits. So certainly jump on there and check them out for your clubs as a, a really neat resource and tool for any educational opportunity, not just anything horse, but any learning opportunity. Okay, so buzzers. But Emily, what do we do if we don't have buzzers? How do we practice? You can always slap your hand on the table. Kids, anything that makes noise, kids kind of dig it. So if you, um, you know, whoever can slap their hand the fastest wins. There's these buzzer sets in the bottom right corner. Uh, someone from our office was like, oh, we should get those. And so we ordered some and we use them at practice. Um, some of them are broken because we use them so much. Um, and we don't bring those when we travel to contests because they're kind of obnoxious, but kids love it. It's super fun. They light up, it makes them want to press it. And that's what you really want to build, especially at the junior level. You want to build that confidence and that willingness to try. Um, there is a variety of costs. <clears throat> so the top one, I have no idea what how much ours cost because it was here before I started in this county. But I have a picture of the set that we have right now. They are um, $305 at andersonbuzzerssystems.com. Or you can do the cool flashy button ones that are about 40 bucks. And of course, slapping hands is free. Some buzzers can get even more cool and techy if you're into that. Um, I've seen some that have the timer right on them. I've seen some where it's like a handheld item. Um, all There's so much out there. It's incredible. One thing to consider when you're practicing, um, if you search on the internet, if you do, make sure that it's a credible source, such as um, other hippology contests, other universities, extension, anything from those types of resources are excellent. And if you don't have anything that specifically says quiz bowl, if you go to a different contest, such as hippology, just bring that quiz home, test those kids, see if, um, see if the seniors can answer the question a lot of juniors got wrong. It's kind of fun. 
And of course, it's always, if you have siblings that you coach, it's fun to put them on different sides of the table. Just feed that competitive energy. This, this event is super fun. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's pretty intimidating probably at first to the kids, but once they get into it, they have a lot of fun. Um, you can set up tables and uh, have different stations set up. So maybe at one table you have breeds and at another table you have um, parts of the horse identity. And so like you kind of rotate, you can do speed um, matching where like maybe you have colors, um, pictures of horses and, um, lined up and then you have just the term Palomino or Bay and they have to, it's on two tables and each team has to run up and match them as fast as they can and then run back. Um, there's just, there's lots of different fun ways to engage youth to learn the material. I know as a coach, um, it can be overwhelming because there's a lot to learn nutrition, reproduction, um, you know, body parts, uh, disciplines, types and parts of saddles and bridles and tack. And, um, it's just, it can be a lot, um, especially when it gets to penalties and stuff with even in the horse industry. And so, the best thing we can tell you is just start somewhere. Um, usually, especially with the juniors is starting with breeds, um, colors and disciplines. Those are, those are really key things. Um, and then start moving. Obviously when you get to reproduction, that kind of gets a little harder because kids start giggling. Um, but it's definitely a good opportunity to bring more knowledge to our youth, which is so exciting. Brianna or Emily, do you guys have anything to add to that as you guys coach up and bring like concepts to your kiddos? Um, so I guess I have a young team and I usually always have young teams. I seem to be always coaching up um, and every now and then I do like to challenge them and throw them in the next level um, that they will go to so they get experience, but they like the challenge. They really appreciate it. And then as for Quiz Bowl, they do absolutely love it. Um, I have a very young team and last year I didn't let them do Quiz Bowl at state and they were pretty upset with me. Once they figured out how the game was played, they were really mad they didn't get to do it at state, but I didn't want to overwhelm them for their first year. This year I've been demanded that they get to do Quiz Bowl. Yeah, it's fun. And have the kids write the questions. Sometimes that's a great idea to get them in the context or the, the actual book and reading things. Have them write their own questions. Um, maybe it's only like five new questions a day. You know, come back to the club meeting on Wednesday with five new questions and make sure you source them and uh, put a page number because now you're not only teaching them um, a little bit of research, but also... Uh, how to cite, sort, sort and cite, uh, cite different things. So that's kind of fun. Jeopardy oh. is good. Go ahead. I would like to echo what Leanne said. Um, if you've ever put together a quiz bowl contest, there's a lot of questions. So if you can train them at a young age, <laughs> I would like to do this, uh, where they come up with five questions a week, save them. Cause some contests as, um, part of your registration is to submit say 30 questions it's a genius way for people to know what might be had at the contest and help your kids study up. And it gives um, you some time not recreating the wheel as long as they're cited properly. This is correct. The youth also have fun when you're traveling, quizzing the coach, which is a great way for them to practice the terminology and saying it correctly. And then they just have fun trying to stump the coach. <laughs> I'm also putting two other resources in the chat box for you. If you've never used um, these tools, there's free versions. And of course, there's always a paid version, but they're good resources um, for tools to, uh, for me, when I was coaching my horse um, judging team, uh, I put a lot of my penalties and stuff in Quizlet because there's matching and then there's flashcards in Quizlet. And so they can download that app on their personal phone and study on their own time. It doesn't have to be in the club meeting or the team meeting. So um, it, those are just fun ways for to keep the kids engaged um, and to put content into something that you can deliver in a different way.
All right. Any questions on Quiz Bowl? Because we're going to actually move into a new contest if there are no questions. All right. So we're going to move into demonstrations, and I'm going to let Brianna kind of take some lead here. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> okay, so we get to have some fun with our horse youth getting experience with kind of the communication arts side of 4-H. And the best part is it's going to be in an area that they enjoy with the horses. So one of the areas is equine demonstrations. And the big thing with the demonstrations is the kids are going to teach the audience how to do something step by step. Um, and they usually bring in a prop or something to do this. And as you can see with the, this picture, these two girls are showing you how to tie the knot and how to properly do it. And it's really great for the kids to get the experience and confidence of teaching uh, something that they already know. Um, so what I like to do with my kids, uh, and again, I've got young ones and we always kind of start out as the coach, I just help them with the outline and get them started, but encourage them to do the research themselves Otherwise, they try to get the coach to write the whole speech for them, and that kind of takes away from them learning and them being able to deliver the demonstration speech confidently. So I got this really nice outline from the Kansas 4-H Public Speaking. They got a communication series. Um, their information was, to me was really great to, as a coach to kind of break it down to help the youth start creating these. So first of all, they pick a topic. As long as it is horse related, anything related to a horse is what they're going to present at state. Have them come up with a short title or a catchy title or something fun that they like. And then starting off is the introduction. Um, I always tell my kids to either to come up with something fun they want to say, but it's that attention grabber, something to get a hold of the judge and the audience so they're paying attention to what they are talking about. And this is a really nice way for them to have fun starting it. And it kind of will release some of those nerves before they get into the main part of the speech of the body. And for a demonstration, it is. It's step by step. But as they're doing it, they're going to explain what they're using, why they're using it, and why they're doing it that way. And then it's just as many steps as the process will take, depending on what they're doing. Um, obviously, tying a knot, there might not be as many steps as, say, cleaning a saddle. Um, so they'll go through that until they get to the end where they're going to have that summary and conclusion. And I know it looks really short here, but it's a really nice outline to get the kids started. And I did drop, uh, Brianna showed me some really cool resources that I just dropped in the chat box for you from Kansas State 4-H. And if you click on those, there's great descriptions and great outlines um, for these kinds of, of contests. So definitely copy and paste those from the chat box and save them for later. Yep. And they're just broad, pretty much talking about the 4-H communication arts. So there might not be specific to horses, but they're great to get started, especially as a coach who you might not, you might not even know how to start, especially with young kids. Um, it's really easy to overwhelm them writing a speech. That is true. So Brianna's going to tell us a little bit on why illustrated talks is different from demonstrations because they are two different things. So they're put in the same category for our state one, but there is a difference. So demonstration, they're teaching you how to. Illustrated talk is talking about presenting an idea or just a general topic, but using visual aids to convey the message. Um, this could be, as you can see behind this girl, a poster board with pictures, or it could be just with props sitting there. Um, so it's, it is slightly different than a demonstration. Demonstration, they will be going through the steps teaching or illustrated talk, they're gonna be standing and just talking using the props. Um, so again, the outline is very similar to demonstrations, except for instead of how to do something, they're going to tell how to do something. So they're telling you, not showing you. Does that make sense to everyone? The best I could explain it was, um, so one of my kids, they she's working on hers right now, and she picked to do colors. But you can't really do a demonstration on horse colors. So she is going to tell how to tell the difference between horse colors. 
versus my other two team I just got talked into, they're going to demonstrate how to tell the different parts of the sounds, English and Western. So it's kind of a difference between those two different contests in a way. So the general rules for the speaking contest, as I said, demonstration and illustrated talk are kind of in the same category. Again, they have to be in 4-H dress. That is just our North Dakota one. Um, no electronics in the, for like cell phones or iPads or anything like that. It's just a distraction and they don't need that. Making sure, this is the biggest part of them making sure they're writing their own speech, but as a coach, you're assisting them because it should be original, constructed by them and then delivered by them. And as a coach, you can help them make sure they're not accidentally plagiarizing, especially as a young kid, it might be easy to be like, yep, this sounds good. I'm gonna say it just like this. They, they have to put it in their own words. Um, so as long as they understand the content and then they rewrite it, how they would deliver it. And this is where I really stress to my youth, you need to write it in your own words because then it's easier for you to remember and then deliver. Because how I talk versus my 10 year old niece is vastly different. Um, like I said, it just has to be related to the horse industry, any way that it can be tied in. Um, I always make sure and ask the youth, what do you want to talk about? What part of the horse industry do you like, do you find interesting that you want to talk about? I never make them, I never pick the topics. I ask them what they want to do. Otherwise, they're going to have no interest in trying to write the speech. Um, the contestants can use notes, but caution them, any excessive use of notes is going to be counted against them. So they can have flashcards as kind of just a reminder of where they're at, but don't let them sit there and read word for word off of a sheet of paper of what they're doing. Having little bullet points as prompts to kind of keep them on track is okay. Um, and then we have the two age divisions. So we got the junior age division, eight to 13. Um, as of December 31st, and these guys can work either as an individual or a team of two. So as I've got on my team, I have an individual going and I have a team of two, which I was really excited for because one of the people in the team of two is really shy. So I was very happy that she asked me she wanted to do it as long as she could do it as a team with her friend. And then our senior age division is ages 14 to 18 as of December 31st, and these individuals do get to go on to Denver. And again, as you saw from the picture we had at the beginning, we do have, we had a single person in public speaking, and then we had a team in demonstration and illustrated talk go on. Love this, great job. Um, something just to note too, just in, in, if you're hosting your own contest for the electronic devices, having that moderator in the room um, to kind of, be the keeper of that because it's just disrespectful when a phone goes off and a kid's trying to present. It can be a huge blast to their confidence at times. So having that moderator, um, you know, before each kid starts, remind everybody in the audience that phones are not to be used. They need to be silenced. No pictures because the flash can also distract the youth. Um, so that's just things that we encourage, uh, you know, unless the kid, um, you know, parents turn that flash off and maybe want to do that. Um, it, it probably is okay, but definitely just make, want to give the best experience as possible to these youth because it is so scary. So for the senior age division, there is a difference in the length the speech should be. So for the seniors, um, they are going to do about a 12 minute presentation. And remember they can enter either as a team of two or as an individual. So together that total time is only 12 minutes. And for the points, there is a three point deduction for every minute less than nine or more than 12. So between nine to 12 minutes is how long that speech has to be. So as a coach, have, helping them rehearse is pretty important for you to time them because either they're going to get nervous and talk really fast, and then they're going to be short on time, or they might get a little long-winded and talk over that 12 minutes, so then you might have to help them cut it down a little bit. And then for, as our juniors, they their speeches are anywhere from three minutes to about eight minutes long. Um, a lot of the juniors do feel more comfortable going in as a team with their friend, 
Um, but they, if they are confident, they can go in as an individual. And again, they do lose points depending if they're under time or if they're over time. So these are some potential topics. Um, there is a whole list, and I will say many years ago, I literally just typed in demonstration, illustrated talk, horse topics to kind of get an idea for my team to be like, well, what do I want to talk about? And that way they could get a feel of what topics they might want to do. Cause otherwise it's really broad. Like Leanne said, all of these things are super, super broad. So if like, I'm going to talk about health, well, what are you going to talk about in health? That's a long list of what you could do. And it's very, it's just so much content. So it's like, okay, we might need to narrow it down to something really simple. So how to control internal parasites. That's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. And you could talk about that for that probably be about a senior level for about 12 minutes. Easy to do um, versus something of just I'm going to talk about overall health of a horse. OK, well, what does that mean? So just helping them kind of figure out topics. I just have given examples of what they might kind of the overbroad. So if you want feeding, health, history, management, selection of it, um, if they say that something broad like that, then I kind of help them narrow it down into something that is manageable to create a speech on. And I don't, I don't remember where I got my list from, otherwise I'd be happy to share those. Like I said, I got those many, many years ago and they've just been in my giant binder that I found uh, to share with you guys. I will say that um, the list that we shared earlier for the quiz bowl, the ones that is the, um, it's called Horse Smarts from the American Horse Youth Council. I'll find the link and put it in the box. That is probably one of my favorite books because it actually has activities in it that you can do you with youth. And then it's it's developed to go by different topics. So you could literally just start at the beginning of that book and work your way through to give you a little bit of structure. All right, so the fun thing with demonstration illustrated talk is there's going to be some kind of visual aid. Um, so both of them you can use the visual aids for, uh, obviously for demonstration, if you can, it's always better to have the prop. So an example would be if they are talking about how to clean a saddle, they can easily have the saddle there and all the supplies they need to clean the saddle. But if they're talking about how to give a horse an injection and doing a demonstration on that, you might need to be creative on how they're going to demo that because you're not bringing a horse in to most of the rooms to do that. Um, like an example, my girls finally narrowed it down, but we were talking this weekend. They wanted to demonstrate how to saddle a horse, English versus Western. And I'm like, how are you going to get a, a prop to show how to saddle the horse? And they're like, oh, well, we've got these really big barrels we can bring in. Bring in. I'm like, how am I getting that into the room for you guys? Like, I only have a small car to get everything to state for them to do it. Um, and now they've changed their mind and they just want the saddles to talk about parts. So I made it a little bit easier. So when they're thinking props, uh, make sure they, they do think of, like, like it says here, no live animals allowed. You can't bring in a horse to show something as a demonstration, even though it's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, I have seen at our state contest, people do have molds of a horse's leg that they bring in for demonstrations of maybe how to bandage or how to properly put on boots. Um, it can have handouts. As you saw, that you got the three tier posters uh, for illustrated talk. Those are probably the most common and easiest to create something. So there is that visual aid. Um, if they like computers, they are more than welcome to create a PowerPoint uh, video, um, any kind of slides, uh, as long as they provide it on a USB drive. And hopefully they practice it on a few other computers. So there, it kind of helps with the technical issues. But if you start using the technology, Make sure you practice with it so there isn't those uh, technical issues. So here are some of my things to keep in mind, especially working with youth when they're starting to create their poster or their presentation is just trying to keep these main areas in, in mind. So visibility, if it's on a poster, is it big enough to see kind of from a distance? But at the same time, you keep it simple because if you start getting too many words, it's too hard to see. That judge might not be able to see it if people are walking by and they have to stop and like really squint at it. It's not really simple and it's hard to see. Um, making it interesting and useful at the same time. So this is where bullet points are going to come in because they shouldn't have everything they're going to say word for word on the poster or in the PowerPoint. They should be able to just have a bullet point 
and then talk about it. And that goes with the structure and the information on it. Um, obviously on a poster, they shouldn't be bouncing back and forth. It should kind of flow within the poster. The same thing with the PowerPoint is very easy to get a flow going with the PowerPoint. Um, so some of the things, to, especially with youth to keep in mind is the use of color when they are doing this. Most of the time they're like, you know what? These are my favorite two colors. I like pink and purple. We're gonna use those colors. They don't contrast very well when you're creating a board or if you're creating a presentation on a PowerPoint, it makes it hard to see. So telling them to keep it simple, um, this was a really great chart I found talking about the basic colors. So yeah, if you're gonna use white, you can use almost um, a number of colors that are darker. So it's going to be an opposite contrast so you can see it. And you can see here, most visible, vis visible to least visible. Thinking about if you step away and you look at that board, how, how easy is it to read what's on that board? Um, graphics, keeping it consistent with that clear message, but again, making it something simple and easy to see. Now, if they're using pictures that they're getting off the internet, it's very important that they cite it. That's not their picture. They have to give credit where credit's due. Um, so in my youth, like my niece is doing colors. Like if you find pictures, you need to keep that site source somewhere and I will help you create, learn how to source it and to actually have a resource page. Um, especially in PowerPoints, if they're getting those graphics offline, they need to be able to cite it. It's not their graphics, they, they don't own it. And it's a really great thing for them to learn, especially with school. Um, kind of a fun thing I did find out was backgrounds using in PowerPoints, these colors for the backgrounds actually mean something and will actually kind of emote to the audience and kind of give them a feeling as they are going through and they are going through uh, watching that presentation. Leanne, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so uh, one of the individuals just um, brought to my attention that one of the links for the illustrated talk isn't working. So I will work on finding that for you guys. Um, so thanks for bringing that to my attention. Uh, so um, still kind of moving forward with the demonstration and illustrated talks. Uh, it's okay. In fact, we encourage that contestant to introduce themselves by name, county and presentation topic. Uh, contestants should cite major resource materials at the end of their presentation, and that does not count in the allotted time. So um, once they go to that site, that, that or like if they're really on the edge of their 12 minutes or nine minutes, whichever division category they're in, um, it won't count. So if they wanted to read through those references, that's perfectly fine, um, or they can just show it up there on the screen. Only the judge can ask questions, so no audience members um, can ask questions. And uh, I have some fun activities when we get to um, the end of this uh, presentation on, on what you can do with your youth with questions and answers. But when encourage your, your students and your, your youth to repeat the question, not only does that give them some time to think before they actually answer, but um, it also is just a courteous, uh, respectful thing to do, especially as they are basically interviewing. Um, it's really good interviewing skills. It's good um, if they're ever holding a clinic um, and they're on one side of the room and the other side of the room can't hear it, you wanna repeat that question. Um, so definitely uh, train your um, participants to repeat that question. And then, once the individual uh, or the team has started, they cannot receive any assistance from any coach, parent, audience member, or other person. Uh, that penalty for violating that is disqualification. So once they've started, um, they are on their own. All right. Brianna, did you wanna do this one? Yeah, I can run over this. And by the way, I threw the link in for the illustrated talk. Um, you ah. somehow four got behind your PDF there. That's why I um, So for North Dakota, we do have a really nice scorecard that has uh, contestants and a judge is really great to kind of go through and look at of what you are going to be judged on and maybe what you definitely can work for when you're creating the demonstration or illustrated talk. 
Um, so this is kind of the nice breakdown of what is going to be, the judge is going to be looking for. Um, ties are going to be broken on the accumulated delivery score, um, the organization score, and then the overall content and accuracy of the actual presentation. Um, this is a really nice thing, especially the, the youth should be uh, familiar with this as well as the coach, um, just so they do get in the habit of looking and understanding this kind of information for themselves. Yeah, and I definitely echo that. Um, it's one thing for you as a coach and an a 4-H leader, extension professional to know the standard of what they're being judged against. But really, the youth should know this. That way, they know what all is incorporated and why it's important to fulfill each one of these. So, for example, I would look at this and be like, oh, well, content and accuracy and organization has the most points. So I really need to pay attention detail wise to those concepts. Maybe I don't have as good of an introduction and a summary. Um, and maybe I'm not super in tune to its effect on the audience for five points, but I really want to hone in on delivery um, content and organization. So just kind of getting them to really uh, maybe answer these questions for themselves. Maybe you just have one club meeting where you walk through these questions about their topic um, and kind of help them identify uh, the importance of this. And again, it's really critical that we, instead of just going through all these contests and preparing them for this contest, that we really as coaches and leaders, um, we this is our chance to really shine why this benefits to them. What, it, what are the skills that they're developing? And so these stage presence, the delivery, um, the organization, all of this stuff, and why is it important to their life skills and as they become a, an adult and, and the importance of it. And you could even have a discussion be like, why, what, where is this going to actually help you in different parts of your life? Um, and have them kind of have that growth mindset and think of different areas for themselves. Just a little side note. All right, we're going to jump into public speaking. All right, so the other side, um, so there's two contests for this, and I kind of call it the horse communication arts, demonstration, illustrated talk, and then public speaking. Um, so this is designed to encourage the youth to discuss something related to the horse industry or just to horses. There is absolutely no visual aids that's going to be used in this contest. So it is pretty much just a speech. So again, the same, same rules um, as we talked about before uh, for this contest as the, uh, as the uh, previous one with the junior division, they can work as a single or a team of two, same thing with the seniors. So if they are nervous to do it by themselves, but they have a friend, they, they would be more than happy to do it with, encourage them to do it together. Um, so for public speaking, it is just you and your voice. Um, so like, like I said, there's no visual aids, no handouts, um, no bibliographies, no pamphlets, nothing. It is just them and their voice. Um, if they do use any visual aids, they are going to be disqualified. And in the national rules, it specifically says that youth can't even hand out pre or post. So I'm I must mean that somebody probably went around and handed up st out stuff before they began. So just again, absolutely nothing, just like Brianna said. You can have note cards, correct? For speech? Yes, you can have for, for your personal speech. That's a great, thank you for bringing that up. It's just, you can't hand out or show anything. Yeah, if you go back in the rules, it says the same thing. They can have prompts, but again, they'll be penalized if they are yep. reading word for word, just like this, they, they will get penalized for using excessive use of notes. But again, the, if they are super nervous, having those prompts will help kind of keep them on track. Mm -hmm. So in kind of like I teach in uh, horse judging for reasons, you know, make sure kind of Brianna said it earlier, make sure they bullet things and try not to let them write every word out word for word that they're going to say on their note card, because then they'll be tempted to memorize it. And anytime we try to memorize something, if we even forget the the that we wanted to say, it completely blanks out everything else. So really try to encourage them. You know, you are so smart. You can finish the sentence without writing it down. You just need the big topic items to get you through. 
So for our seniors, their length of this speech is going to be seven to 10 minutes long. Again, if it's a team, you know, try to make it a balance, especially between them. If one of them is more confident, you don't want them speaking the whole time, but they do lose points if they are, for every minute they're under seven or they're over 10 minutes. They're gonna lose uh, three points each time. Um, our juniors, they only have a three to five minute speech. So again, if they're practicing, making sure to time them to know where they're at. Um, normally, if they get in front of a crowd or their team, juniors especially will probably speed up and they're gonna end up being under. So always trying to find that nice happy medium of about four minutes. It will kind of help if they are too slow or if they're too fast. All right, so again, same as the last contest, pretty much same introduction. Uh, they can state their name, county, and their speech topic. And again, they definitely should cite some references if they have any. Um, they can certainly, once they start those references, I would make sure that they identify, and my references are, because that way they know to stop the time. Because again, the time won't be counted um, for reference identification. Again, only the judges can ask the questions and again, encourage your youth to learn to repeat the question. Uh, that way it often too helps them remember what the question actually was. And so they can answer it in its entirety. And then uh, once they've started, absolutely no help from coach, parent, audience, or anybody else. Again, that is a disqualification if they have any help from the audience. So this is the horse public speaking score card again, it going through um, what the judge is going to be looking for. And as Leanne pointed out last time, the areas that are the most points. So the content and accuracy and the delivery, um, the delivery score organization and content. So it's very similar to the demonstration illustrated talk when they are creating uh, this speech. Reminding them that the introduction as you know, it's only worth 10 points, but it should only be about 15% of that speech. Mm -hmm. Majority of the speech is the body. So that is going to be that content and that accuracy of that speech. Um, and then the summary is only about 5%. So as you can imagine, that's 80% is that body and all of that information that they are going to be sharing with the judge and their audience. Yeah, and this one's a fun one. I, I put this fun little picture of this little um, girl like doing, talking with her hands because delivery is a big portion of public speaking. It's storytelling, it's excitement, it's energy. And so having your youth identify, what does that look like when they just tell a story to you? They're excited and they're happy to tell it. Or if they get sad, they show that remorse or whatnot, whether it's facial expression, voice inflection, um, you know, body language, maybe it's facial expression. Uh, for horse judging, I have my kids, they would give in the mirror so they could kind of see what they're doing. Because sometimes uh, we unintentionally have a little... Nicks, like for example, um, for public speaking, they might do some rocking because they're nervous. And so it's nice to video them so they can actually see what they're doing. And it's not just you as the coach being like, stop rocking, stop rocking, stop rocking. Um, it's they can kind of see and be like, what do you think you can do better? Sometimes we have to steer away from us coach always telling them what they need to do and let them have that growth mindset and identify, hey, what do you think you could do to improve this score? What are some things that you see that um, in after watching this video that you could improve on? Giving them that opportunity to critique for corrective feedback themselves. And the one thing about public speaking different from reasons is being able to move and have gestures and even move, they can use that nervous energy doing that instead of wanting to rock. So if they do kind of rock, you can help them be like, just make a small step this way and talk over this direction. Then you can step over here and talk with this direction versus having to stand still and be really proper for reasons. They can move, they can use that nervous energy and kind of not, not be drastic about it, but talk with their hands and then and move a little bit. Not so much that it's distracting. Mm -hmm. um, so creating the public speak, this is kind of the area, it, it follows similar to the same 
outline as the other two of what their purpose is. And when I mean purpose, it's do you want to be funny? Do you want to be serious? Do you want to be sad? Because that's going to help them know how they're going to deliver it. So if they're going to figure out like, I want to do something that is really serious and dramatic. Okay, now what topic are we going to do that follows along with the purpose of it? Is it a really sad history of a horse that you learned about that um, kind of speaks to your heart. And it, it, it was sad. It was a sad story. So I'm going to share that. And again, following that with that attention getter um, and then their overall welcoming and opening and a preview of what they are about to talk about. Again, that 80% is that body. So they're going to be doing most of the speech writing and talk during that body of what the main point is with the supporting information. With this, I think about you talk about one sentence, main point, three to four sentences, supporting information. Um, and this is where the bullets come in. And then going down to that conclusion. I always have to take a step back because I rodeo queen and we did write out the speech word for word. Mm -hmm. um, so with your youth, it's not very encouraging to let them write it out word for word. As Leanne said, they're gonna memorize it. And for queening, I did memorize it, but that is where we'll get into the delivery and the practice of it. Of it oops, I forgot a word, I can keep on going. Um, versus a youth is going to be like, oh, crap, what's after I said that? And they definitely do that. So the main points and letting them just kind of flow through it and talk just as long as they're hitting those main points and, again, putting it in their own words. All right. So we've kind of been talking a lot about horse stuff and let's really hone in again on the delivery. Brianna and I've kind of sprinkled it in here and there, but now Brianna is really going to talk to what does that look like? So we talk about showmanship with horses, but when it comes to any type of public speaking event, it's showmanship of that youth. Um, these were kind of the nice bullets that I came across to really highlight it. Um, so the kid is going to, as you're helping them practice, have them think about their poise. Um, so are they going to be, you want them to be calm and confident. You don't want them to be scared. You don't want them to be really nervous. And then like Leanne said, help them identify what their distracting behaviors are. Because if you've ever done any public speaking, you realize that you don't even know what your distracting behaviors are. And the youth certainly don't. I have so much fun in team problem going, what were you doing? And they have no idea that they were rocking or they were fidgeting with their hair or fidgeting with their fingers in front. It's um, just helping them identify that so they can catch themselves um, as they continue practicing. Um, their voice, having them speak every word clearly, obviously they're going to get nervous. So they're going to want to speed up really fast. And if you do have a youth that maybe they lost some teeth, they might have a little bit of a lisp going on, helping them say, okay, say that a word again, just a little bit clearer, maybe slow down on that word so they can say it clearly. Um, the volume level for the space. Obviously, if they're in a theater auditorium and the judge is sitting halfway across the auditorium, they're going to need to speak up and speak to that judge versus in a small room where it might just be two or three people and the judge and you're right close to each other. You don't need to speak like you're trying to reach them across the auditorium. Um, so the life and kind of the tone of voice is going to go with what they're talking about. Like I said, public speaking, are they going to be funny? Do they want to be serious? Obviously, if they're saying something serious, they shouldn't be using a tone of voice that uh, is, has a little bit of humor in it. Um, so that's a little bit of where they can play and have acting. And they're going to express what their passion is. They chose the topic. They're talking about it. So they should have some emotions and passion delivering something that they created themselves and should have a lot of fun doing it. Eye contact, this is the big one, especially for youth. Having that visual eye contact with the audience. Most of the time that is going to make youth really scared to have to look at someone in the eyes. Um, the best way to have them start doing this is kind of just scan the room and just tell them, look over top of people's heads. It looks like you're looking them in the eye but that way you're scanning. So you shouldn't be, I'm talking to this wall. I'm talking to this chair. I'm not looking at anyone else. I'm going to talk to this chair, but having them scan and say, pick three points in the room and just go between those three points will help you start making eye contact. And hopefully their nerves come down and they feel confident enough to look at the judge and then keep moving. Um, don't have them dead stare at the judge and be like, I'm talking to you and you're listening to me. Having them scan will kind of help again with that nervous energy. 
Um, like we said, gestures. Let them move. Let them have some gestures, but don't don't go crazy. Don't be too distracting that you're going to start on one side of the room and bounce all the way to the other. Um, a few movements is okay, kind of stepping forward and stepping back, but not um, pretty much sprinting around the room. And that way they can have, have some expression that goes with that emotion a little bit and have, letting them have fun. I call this the Goldilocks a little bit. Um, you don't want to be not too fast, not too slow, just right in the middle. Uh, I am one who you put me in front of a crowd and I just naturally speed up. I am a fast talker anyways. So once I get in front, I talk really fast. And this is where practice is going to come in and you will ask your youth to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse to the point that they're sick of it. But when they're delivering it, it comes off as just a natural speed, like right in the middle. And they get used to their gestures and their movements and where they can do some pauses for effect and some emphasis, it just becomes natural. You want them to be really well rehearsed and poised, but not robotic. And one of the biggest things is you just got to keep it fun. Um, if it gets too serious or they get, you know, it becomes an environment where they're just not having fun at all, the, the likelihood of them having that passion, having and showing that emotion um, is going to be pretty slim. So anytime that you can make it fun it is super key. Remember that, you know, not to stress out. It's not all about winning. And you're talking, I, I can say that from being one of the most competitive people probably on this call. Um, it's, it's just, it's way more, you know, it's the journey up into that day that they get to present that topic, all that they've learned, all the confidence they've gained and help them remember that, help them remember where they've come from. Um, you're the encourager, you're the one voice that they get to hear as a mentor. And then a great thing with the practices is, um, so if they are doing a demonstration or illustrated talk, I'll use illustrated talk, for example, um, encourage your youth to do it more than once. You're not just doing it for the state horse contest. If it's an illustrated talk and they've made a nice poster board, they can practice and do join Project Expo. A great practice is competing at their county's communication arts. So they get that experience of a judge and they get feedback before they get to the state um, contest. Um, another thing to do is if it's a demonstration, most clubs will ask a youth to do a demonstration and doing it in front of their club is probably gonna be the biggest audience they have. So it's really nerve wracking but it's just a great place to practice. And if you mess up, they don't know you're having fun. These are your friends that are in the club, but it just helps them get in front of an audience. So the first time they're delivering it isn't at state. And then I told them they're going to be doing it in front of me as well as just a practice. But I really encourage them to do it at use that information and in those speeches for other things. And again, if it's a poster board too, parents really love this. You get to use it four times. I'm going to use it for Project Expo, Communication Arts at the county level, maybe districts, state horse, and hey, look at that. I have a static exhibit for the fair as well that they can talk about it again. Um, so they can recycle it and use it all year long so it's not a one and done thing and they totally forget what they were talking about. Yes, Emily's had some good words. Get that mileage out of those posters. <laughs> so thank you for saying that. Um, such good, good, good concepts. Uh, again, take the four off of the end of this uh, one. So I apologize for that. That's where that hang up is on the illustrated talk one. Um, something that's fun, especially when it comes to just learning and putting an eye on what is a standard or what is correct. Um, maybe some of you have or have not heard of Kid President. Have your kids watch him. He is hilarious. And just his mannerisms as he talks, he, he can tell like he's very he's an influencer. And so have the youth identify after they watch Kid President, what did you like about it? Um, what did you take away uh, from his presence when he was doing stuff? What could have he done better? Um, talk about those. In the chat, um, I just put a couple of references. There's uh, one that's 17 TED Talks for Kids to Inspire Little Minds to Do Big Things. And then there's 10 TED Talks by Brilliant Kids. Um, again, you know, we learn from each other. Uh, we learn from watching each other. We grow in those aspects. And so anytime you can present uh, something in a different mode, because we all learn differently, 
maybe they'll pick up something you've t- been telling them as a coach multiple times, but they'll see it in a video from somebody else and then the light bulb will just come on. Um, so really giving different modes of learning tools to them too. Uh, so I've, I've found that some of those tools are helpful. And with that, those youth will be able to, I guess I, I sit help them be like, it's a stage present. Like, okay, maybe you are really shy, but if they can be like, when I'm on this stage, I'm, I'm playing pretend I'm a different person. Uh, that might help <coughs> with, with the nerves. So that way they're like, okay, I need to project and I need, I get to act like this. Um, they do watch a lot of social media and videos. So telling them that it's a skit might help some of those nerves come out where they're like, well, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I can't do this by myself. But if you help them get up there and be like, it's a skit, just have fun. Uh, they might be more willing to do that. So watching these other videos being like, pretend you're making a video like kid president mm-hmm. might, might help them get out of their shell a little bit. That's a good way to, good way to, to talk about. In fact, that kind of segues right into some of the fun ways again, making it fun is key. Um, so starting with just telling a story when the kid comes up and is like, no, I can't do that. Well, tell me a story. What's your favorite thing? Tell me about a fun activity that you did. Then they'll tell you and be like, you just did a public speaking event. And they're like, wait, why? Like they don't understand. Um, so engaging them in just little things can be key. Um, you know, Brian already mentioned it uh, to make sure that they're not just speaking um, to themselves or to you as a coach, getting them in front of family members, or maybe the council, 4-H council is holding a meeting and they have some extra time and, and you, some of your kids can present in front of the council and get some feedback. That's a really great opportunity. And it's fun for the council members to see what you guys are up to. Um, and it, it's just, it's a neat way to get the community involved. You know, 4-H is all about community. And so if we can bring in the community to have those kind of um, events, they love to see um, presenting kids. Have you send videos of their speech and presentation to you again? That's key. And then again, don't just jump out there as a coach and say, well, you need to fix this, this, and this. Have them, okay, after you've watched this video, what can you see in the video that you could work on? Are there any word pronunciations? Can you emphasize something differently? How's your conclusion? Walk through the standard and identify it. Have them grade themselves. See how that goes. Um, put that uh, um, rubric in their, in their hands and be like, okay, what would you give yourself after watching that video? Um, question and answers. This is always fun. Um, We used to do this in Florida and it was kind of a neat opportunity because it's scary to get questions from the judge. So that whole little component of the contest is answering questions can be so scary. And so working on answering questions. So what we used to do is we would bring in professionals um, like a veterinarian or um, brand inspector or, you know, you name it. And then we would have the kids ready with questions. And then those kids had to ask the adult or the expert questions. So not only is it a learning opportunity, but they're the ones asking questions. So they kind of have a role reversal, um, encourages them to have some, a bit of a confidence that it's not as scary as maybe it seems. Um, On the far right, uh, drawing topics or words out of a hat and doing impromptu speeches or demos. Um, Maybe it's acting something out, kind of like, um, one of those games, I totally don't know what the name of it is, but you get a, a word and you have to act it out or something for everybody to guess. Um, you know, impromptu speeches uh, it encourages creativity and imagination. And so it's kind of a fun way to really hone in on uh, their, their speaking and communication skills. Story time with pictures, kind of the same thing. Maybe have all your members bring in something. Maybe it's an item that represents them. So maybe like I take this little 4-H pig and I bring this in and it's story time because I'm going to tell what this pig means to me. So I'm going to have an introduction. I'm still going to follow the format of, um, you know, public speaking demo or whichever category I'm in. But I'm going to I'm going to have fun because I'm going to do something completely random and I'm going to tell everybody about something that's important to me. Um, Using videos, like I just mentioned, uh, to learn different ways people speak and then having them critique them and identify what they could do to either mimic something they really liked. Like, for example, I really love um, Chad Littlefield. 
If you've never heard of him, he is a great um, motivative speaker and mentor in terms of lots of little things. Google him. He's got a YouTube channel. But he like he really talks with his hands. And I've always been taught not to talk with my hands. And so um, on a virtual setting, it, it tends to be kind of a neat uh, thing. So it's something that I want to learn and capture. Uh, and that's what I've got from watching him. So it, it helps to kind of just learn from other people and then discuss afterwards what are some of those things. And Anne, I'm, uh, can I call on someone? Um, yes. So Julie Hasselbrook is, has been a hypology coach for a long time, and she always has great uh, attendance for the public speaking and demonstration. So Julie says she'd be willing to share anything, um, any of her wisdom she's done it over the years, because she's had great participation for, throughout the many, many years of. So Julie? I did give her a heads up before I called on her. <laughs> ah, now you can hear me, correct? Yes, we can. Yes. Very good. Well, thank you, Brianne. Uh, you know, it's getting to know the youth that you're working with. And as you guys have covered so many things, we kind of try to hone in what their strengths and what their weaknesses are and what they like, much like what you've said, you know, in inspiration. So what, what would it inspire you? What's something you'd like to do? And, you know, there's some kids that will, if you promise to paint your hair pink, that will inspire them to, yes, I will do it. I will do it. There's others that maybe it is a helmet. Maybe it's a gift certificate um, to set goals as to how and where. And one thing that we have found is working with our extension agent, we just really, truly appreciate them because setting up and trying to get ready for the state horse contest in the public speaking areas, uh, we work hand in hand with Cindy and she is so gracious to set the county communication arts contest so that it lands prior to our state contest. And it's one of those wonderful pieces that you've talked about being able to present in front of a different group, but still a small, somewhat intimate group that you feel comfortable in. And you have someone that is smiling and giving you tips and judging. And we've had just a lot of fun with that. Something we did last year, and we're going to be doing again this year, is coming up on March 5th, we are holding an un-contest. So we have an un-contest of hypology. It'll be the entire full-blown contest, except for there will not be any scores. We will not be giving out awards. As soon as all the teams have gone through, we hand out answer sheets. And then everyone can go back through, look at what they got right, what they got wrong. Mm -hmm. Quiz contest is the same thing. Um, we work with the junior teams. We may mix the teams up. Uh, we may ask questions such as how many legs does a horse have just to get them feeling really comfortable. And last year we did add the element of if you've got a speech or a demo and would like to present it, we have a, a wonderful resource that's um, a professor and teacher over at the uh, State School of Science that is interested in horses. And she actually took one of the young men and showed him literally that it's a dance in his speaking. And she actually took him out and waltzed with him on the floor to say, yes, relax, and you'll come naturally. And it was just so much fun to see how that helped him relax and speak and, and excel in it. Um, many of the things that you've talked about are, are things that we have been doing and have done. Uh, we let the first little ones, uh, their first year, we say, no, you don't need to. You need to watch and learn. And they sometimes serve as the judges for their older peers. And then we kind of say the second year we really would like and that's when we pull in moms and dads and grandmas and aunts and uncles. And it takes a whole community to work with those youth because not everybody has the time, whether it's mom or dad and sometimes grandma 
or the next door neighbor really are the key people. I think that kind of covers it. That was amazing, Julie. Thank you so much for your input. And I just, I love that you even mentioned goals because I feel like we miss that concept of, of um, teaching sometimes and goals can be a huge way to encourage a growth mindset and getting our youth to really dream big. So thank you so much for sharing. Leanne, that, that's one point I'll ask on. We try to find reasons to celebrate and they can be just about anything. We celebrated and had cookies and uh, noisemakers uh, at our last get together because it was the first time that all of our youth had made it and gone through a contest. Very cool. And we said, hey, let's celebrate that. And that's what we kind of do. And we do some goal setting too, as far as, you know, if we all make it to state and make it through state, sometimes <laughs> that's, a, that's a goal in itself. Heck yeah. Um, what are we going to do? Where do you want to go? What should we see? Um, and let them let them decide what what they would like to see happen if as a group they achieve. And that way they really do work and and build up each other as as a group. And it's kind of fun to see that whole piece come together. Man, I love that. That's inspiring, Julie. Thank you so much for sharing that piece. Anytime we can celebrate even the smallest success is huge. Even if it's just you came to practice for a day, thank you for walking in the door because um, that's the first step. Uh, just some really cool uh, opportunities. I'm, I bet you guys have some great uh, recruitment strategies that you guys all do out there too on this call. Um, it's hard sometimes to find kids because again, this is somewhat intimidating if they've never done it before. But anybody, obviously, that has interest in horses, oftentimes, uh, I think there's a, a misnomer when it comes to contests, especially that involve animals, uh, just the word horse or the word livestock, it's automatically assumed they have to have that animal, they have to own it. And so making sure that you're uh, encouraging you that you don't have to have a horse to compete in any of this, you just got to love them as much as we do, um, and love to learn about them and want to be involved. Um, you know, some people host different mock contests just to get them excited, not a full blown out contest, but just a couple questions. I loved Julie's uh, aunt, uh, option of just throwing some of those fun questions in there of um, how many legs does a horse have? Like, it's just, it kind of makes everybody giggle and uh, build that confidence. Um, have an introductory meeting just to talk about it, encourage them. Some coaches, because our contest is the way it's set up, is that Saturday is your horse judging and apology, and then the next day is your judging or your, your all of your quiz bowl, public speaking demo, and um, and illustrated talks. They, I don't want to say they make them stay here, but it's it's just a great segue into the the next chapter of those contests, and so. Um, they're just strongly encouraged. I mean, you're already here, especially if you're traveling 400 miles across the state. Um, let's do it anyways. Um, and then, you know, encouraging a team member to bring along a friend. Um, most, most horse people stick together. And so it's likely they have another horse friend that they could bring along. Emily. Yeah. All right. So I know that it's 818 on a Wednesday night. So kudos to you 16 who are still on the call. <laughs> Just one more thing before we say adios or ask any questions at the end. Um, I always go back to why do we do what we do? I think sometimes, especially as competitive people, sometimes we forget why we got into this in the first place. Or if it's a challenging season, maybe there's a parent who could be challenging or <laughs> COVID-19 happened in 2020 and that really rocked some things. Always go back to why do we do what we do? So if you wouldn't mind, if you want to put in the chat, why do you coach or why are you interested in coaching? Ooh, I love this. And if you feel you want to unmute, that's okay too. Maybe start with you, Emily. Why do you Enjoy. coach? Why do I coach? So it gives me the 
the, my horse fix because I don't currently have horses up here. But I, I did quiz bowl when I was a 4-H'er and I really enjoyed it. And um, when I came up to Ward County, you know, the opportunity came to be involved with this. And I'm like, this will be fun. And, and I have an equine minor and, and now I'm a 4-H agent. So it kind of gives me that way I can scratch that itch in a way. And then when 2020 happened, that's when I really started to think about why do I do what I do? Because I don't have kids in 4-H, but I get such joy and such passion when I'm around these kids who are excited about something. And it happens to be something that I like. And so um, it's helped me keep going. Look at all these. Yes, this is awesome. Teaching new kids about horses. Yes. Um, first time you show them a reigning horse video and their, uh, their jaw drops. I love that moment. Okay. It's awesome. It's what, what I look for that childlike wonder of, wow, really? Okay. Look at all these coming in yeah. to show you that there are, they are capable of doing what they set their minds to. I love that Eric to see the growth in our youth that we know will happen with these types of projects and competitions. Awesome. And I mean, and I enjoy watching the kids grow in their knowledge through the year. Yeah. Just that progression. Mm -hmm. Love it. Share this because Julie accidentally direct messaged me. She said, it's simple to give back. I have been so blessed by others who helped me. Yeah. Yes, it is. All right, Leanne, if you want to click. So at the beginning of the year, what I say to my team, um, what are some of our goals this year? And usually it's a way for them to let me know, hey, we want to learn more about these topics. Um, I'd like to get better at reasons. I would like to um, improve this and this. Sometimes we say, yeah, we want to win the state contest. And that might be an awesome, realistic goal, which is great. I want them to dream big. Um, we had a team go to nationals this year and a whole bunch of little girls were like, that's going to be us. And I'm like, yes, it can. So I always try to encourage the team, especially at the beginning of the year. Um, what are your goals that you want to have? What are your things you want to learn about? And you can always incorporate that with quiz bowl. If you don't know, I really like quiz bowl. Um, <laughs> and then the last thing I want to touch on, and I got this from Pat Lencioni, the ideal team player, every team, every organization has values, whether you realize it or not. And, um, I started doing this a few years ago with the littles, with the younger kids and, um, Pat Lencioni talks about the ultimate team player is humble, hungry, and smart. Okay. I, um, so humble explains itself, right? It doesn't put itself above others. Hungry. You're always looking for more things. Or in this case, you're, you're hungry for more knowledge on something and smart. He talks about emotional intelligence, which I think is great, but sometimes that go over, goes over kids' heads. So when I talk to my team, I say, we are kind, we're tough, we're smart. Cause I feel like telling a bunch of girls that you're hungry is not a good thing to say, mm -hmm. um, just for youth development wise. And so kind, I said, if you're having a bad day and you can't do all three, pick kind. We're always gonna start with that. We treat each other with respect and we treat ourselves with respect. Number two, we're tough. And that kind of leads to, you know, maybe what we do for fun. That doesn't mean that we um, shove each other and wrestle or whatever, but we do things that maybe makes us uncomfortable for the sake of getting better. So a lot of times I bring this up when they say, well, I don't want to give reasons. I said, well, we're a tough team. We do things that, you know, push ourselves. And then of course, the last one is smart. I don't know how many times I've heard kids say, I can't get this. I'm not smart. I can't figure this out. I'm stupid. And I said, we are never saying that again. We will figure this out because we're resilient. And so I'd like to sprinkle in some emotional intelligence, but for now we'll just be, we will figure things out. So those are, those are the things that I try to remind my team and um, Julie is an excellent example of this. Um, 
and I'm sure everybody can think of one adult when you were a kid. All it takes is one adult to make a difference in a kid's life. And that one adult could be you. There's a lot of things stacked against kids these days. And all it takes is one person to make a difference. And that could be you. So yeah. thanks, awesome. guys. <laughs> that was pretty darn powerful. And it really compliments Sandra's um, comment. And she said that I feel that our youth need someone in their corner. Plus, mm -hmm. I love sharing my passion of learning and the love of horses and get to share these memories with my own daughter. I love seeing their faces when they accomplish something. So having somebody in your corner is huge, just like what Emily just said. So thank you so much for saying those wise words um, for us all to take home, Emily. That was awesome. Um, as it says in the uh, top there, all of these are being recorded. Uh, they will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel, which I will drop that link um, in the chat box when I find it here. It is um, easy to Google, but it's nice to, here we go. And then obviously it'll also be posted on our Facebook page too. I have a really quick question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I saw this happen. We went to the Crookston um, Quiz Bowl this weekend. And when they were doing bonus questions, they let them have a scratch piece of paper there and then the kids could all talk. And then the, the captain was the only one who could give the ant buzz in and give the answer, but they could write down that. Is that not what we do here in North Dakota, right? Because I've never seen it. And I was just kind of wondering. Correct. We do not. Um, maybe we could do that for the juniors, but at the senior table, nothing is allowed at the senior table. That's a good question, though. And again, we just really try to parallel the national uh, contest results so, or rules. So we, the seniors have an idea once they win our, uh, a state contest, then they have a, a concept of how the rules are going to play out when they head to nationals. I would hate for one of our senior teams to bring in a piece of paper at the national contest and get disqualified. Great question, though. What other questions do you guys have? Well, we sure appreciate you guys hanging on. And um, it looks like from the poll that you guys uh, got some good stuff out of it. So we sure appreciate you guys coming on. And if, if no other questions, we hope that you have a fantastic night. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm.